for you. One for me. When I'm up there in hypersleep. Or traveling near the speed of light. Time's gonna change for me. To say that Christopher Nolan has made a habit of distorting time is an understatement. That the director of arthouse-worthy superhero fare and mind-bending blockbusters will explore the nature of time in his films is as much a given as Michael Caine appearing in said films. In a dream, your mind functions more quickly, therefore time seems to feel more slow. Five minutes in the real world gives you an hour in the dream. It's like waking. It's like you just woke up. Tenet seems like it could be a convergence of Nolan's career-long exploration of time. It's a shot in the dark, with the director's notoriously secretive process, to guess what the film's concept of inversion is. Time travel. No. But we can look back at his work and shine a little bit of light to make it less of a wild guess. We can even do it in the most Nolan-esque way there is. Out of order. Here follows a brief history of Christopher Nolan and time. Maybe you get an idea about what you want to do next, but you don't remember what you just did. Making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. Christopher Nolan's first film is the 70-minute non-linear noir following. The film structure was born from practical concerns as much as anything else. It was made on the cheap and shot on weekends over the course of a year. But Nolan leaned into these restrictions, playing with time in his film structure as a way to feed into classic noir tropes. Who's playing who? Who can you trust? These are the questions at the center of every great mystery, and Nolan's manipulation of following's timeline makes these questions more intriguing. We're launched into London's underworld as ill-equipped as the film's protagonist, armed with only a vague notion of what's in store for him in each scene. In other words, Nolan made following non-linear specifically to withhold information from the audience, which made the plot a hell of a lot more mysterious. So are you going to explain? Who's for a friend? The police think he did something and he didn't. So he needs a decoy. Another likely suspect. Cool suits, cooler set pieces, and a boatload of exposition, Inception set the rules for the world of dreams and then explored it with Nolan's entire bag of tricks, beginning with his trademark prologue full of imagery we'll come to understand later in the movie. But that's where the non-linear storytelling in Inception ends. The film truly manipulates time through its incredible use of slow motion. How much time is that? It's a week, the first level down, six months, the second level down, and the third level is 10 years. And so we get incredible distortions of time that come to indicate what's happening in the here and now, what's happening one layer above or below the here and now, and most importantly, what is real. As images flash in the mind of Leonardo DiCaprio's Cobb, some are slow-mo, some are at speed, and it's up to us to decide how real they are. The movie ultimately leaves Cobb's reality up to the viewer as well. How real is the story of his exile? In a film full of iconic shots of folding cities and spinning hallways, the now ubiquitous blah, perhaps the most iconic of them also provides the fewest answers, the spinning top at the end. What is the most resilient parasite? Bacteria? A virus? An idea? Resilient, highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold of the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. Can I just let myself forget what you've told me? Flashback 10 years before Inception to Nolan's most thorough exploration of an unreliable narrator, with his famously backwards and Academy Award-nominated film Memento. The film plays with time in order to put the viewer firmly in the shoes of its protagonist, Leonard. It's not for us to question what we are seeing, but to experience what's happening to him in the same way he is. And so, we feel his disorientation. Oh, I'm chasing this guy. No, he's chasing me. Like Leonard, we only know what's happening, but not what's just happened, and we're unsure of the motives of everybody he encounters. Memento is a prime example of the form having a function, an entire movie structured specifically to put you in the same shaky step of its main character. So where are you? You're in some motel room? You just you just wake up and you're in, in a motel room. There's the key. It feels like maybe it's just the first time you've been there, but perhaps you've been there for a week, three months. It's, it's 
kind of hard to say. I don't, I don't know. But what about the same shaky step of an entire place and time? Nolan's epic staging of Dunkirk does what many war movies strive to do, put you on the ground and in the sand with the soldiers. This is immediately established from the opening shots, when an otherwise peaceful walk through town is interrupted by gunfire from an unseen enemy. In fact, throughout the entire movie, aside from the planes, we never see the enemy actually fire. Like the soldiers, we can only sit tight and hope the bullets don't hit us. But Nolan takes it one step further. With overlapping timelines that are only vaguely labeled and not completely out of sync, Dunkirk puts you in the middle of the chaos of an entire war, not just one beach or one battle. All of these things happening at more or less the same time makes the film not about winning a war or being a hero, but about being in the middle of a war you can't quite grasp the scope of, a war that you're not sure you can win. Add the element of a score that's largely built around a ticking clock or a quickening pulse and the sum total is a nerve-rattling film in which you can't get your bearings. Nine years earlier, Nolan employed the same tactic in The Dark Knight. While it's narratively linear, Nolan takes advantage of time in the edit. The film is cut within an inch of its life. The pace of The Dark Knight leaves no room to breathe, jumping from one scene to the next in an instant. The Dark Knight even employs what you might call an anti-flashback. Joker's repeated, do you want to know where I got these scars bit, continually teases a backstory we don't get. And that's the point. The Dark Knight is part two of a trilogy. It's unconcerned with where it's been and doesn't set up where it's going until the very end. And in the middle, it's all about plunging you into the chaos of a dangerous city. It's this chaos and tension created by the frenetic pacing of the edit that amplifies one of the film's central themes. What does it take for a good man to go bad? You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. I'm a good cop, yeah. Well, there's always something that they can use, you know, to get at your credibility, you know that. Have you any idea what this is going to do? Like Memento's unreliable narrator, Insomnia's Will Dormer is a legendary detective with some baggage. The flashbacks here are minimal, fleeting visions cut quickly in the space of an Al Pacino close-up. In the beginning of the movie, the flashbacks are images we assume to be Dormer's memories, where he is scrubbing drops of blood off of a shirt sleeve. But as he begins his investigation, he flashes back in the same way to scenes from the murder, showing us how Dormer is interpreting the evidence as he sees it. This means the same technique is being used for both his memory and his imagination. Time, once again, is muddled. And as Dormer digs his hole deeper, going longer and longer without sleep, the distinction between memory and imagination begins to blur. By the end, he realizes he crossed a line a long time ago. I can feel it right there. This is gonna catch up with me. I don't do things like that. Which not did you tie, Borden? So how did it catch up with you? I don't know. The Prestige opens on a familiar Nolan prologue, beginning with the end. But in this case, it's the pledge, the first part of a magic trick. To say an entire movie about rival magicians is structured like a magic trick shouldn't be too shocking. But each trick Angiers and Borden try to steal from each other is presented in a non-linear manner as well, built as little microcosms of the entire story. The prestige bounces back and forth through time, letting the audience try to figure out the tricks alongside the characters. And as one man awaits his hanging for the murder of the other, the story literally has to be told that way. More proof that the technique isn't just a gimmick and is much more evidently brilliant upon a second viewing. Once you know, it's actually very obvious. <laughs> but, elaborate structure aside, the prestige is really about the years-long rivalry between two men determined to take everything from each other. Cutting back and forth between eras of that rivalry allows Nolan to paint their relationship in multiple dimensions. In one scene, we'll see the men reflecting on their lives. In another, they're just starting out. In the next, they're slowly piecing together the tricks that lead them to their fate. What this timeline crystallizes more than anything, however, is what that sort of prolonged animosity can do to a man. I can recognize an obsession. It 
good will come of it. But I know the rage that drives you. That impossible anger strangling the grief until the memory of your loved one is just poison in your veins. Batman Begins is an origin story for the symbol as much as the character, and that's entirely due to Nolan's non-linear storytelling. To start with, the film is a strung together sequence of beginnings, less a straightforward origin, more a collection of the most important moments in the decision to use the symbol of the bat. Falling down the well as a child leads to fighting men in prison and meeting Ducard, which is further explained by his parents' death, training with the League of Shadows, which is itself a montage of bat tactics we've seen before, then the trial of Joe Chill and Bruce's refusal to kill the League's prisoner. It's around the 40 minute mark when Bruce makes the decision to be his own force that Batman Begins progresses in a linear fashion, with the only flashback after that point a quick dream sequence when he's drugged. By gathering the most influential moments in the creation of the Batman idea and letting them intermingle and coexist in a non-linear story, we get to see how they all impacted Bruce's life, how the sum total of these experiences created the Batman. Because the symbol, the focus of Batman Begins, is meant to outlast the man, Nolan presents it in a timeless, non-linear way. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. Shouldn't the people know the hero who saved them? A hero can be anyone, even a man doing something as simple and reassuring as putting a coat around a young boy's shoulders to let him know the world hadn't ended. The third film in Nolan's trilogy admittedly doesn't do much with time. However, it does make good on the promise of Batman Begins. Can a symbol, allowed to be tarnished for the greater good, still hold its power? The Dark Knight Rises answers that question over an indeterminate amount of time. It's nearly impossible to tell how much time passes considering the events that occur. Bane breaks Batman's back, dumps him in prison, Bane takes over Gotham, Bruce heals, escapes, and heads back to Gotham for a final showdown. The Dark Knight Rises doesn't play with time as wickedly as some of Nolan's other films. Instead, it deals with time in bulk. The final film in a trilogy, The Dark Knight Rises, feels like looking back on a life's work. The order of the events ultimately don't matter. All that matters is the legacy Bruce left behind. You don't owe these people anymore. You've given them everything. Not everything. Not yet. It's like we've forgotten who we are at home. Explorers, pioneers, not caretakers. Well, we used to look up in the sky and wonder at our place in the stars. Now we just look down and worry about our place in the dirt. Interstellar begins as a movie about a planet out of time then quickly pivots into an exploration of how vast the universe is and how time, no matter how it's distorted, is a finite resource. Facing the planet's imminent death, the first thing the crew of the Endurance must do is go to sleep for two years. Then we see time warped further on Miller's planet as the team loses years to the giant wave. In Interstellar, though, time is not used for spectacle or a way to play with story structure. Here, Christopher Nolan highlights the power of time and how we, as humans, feel its impact. I'm not afraid of death. I'm an old physicist. I'm afraid of time. We feel it when Romilly is left alone on the Endurance for 23 years, and when Dr. Mann goes slowly crazy on his planet. We feel it in the decades of stored messages Coop watches from his children, a sequence ending with a hard cut to Murph's present day. It's here, in fact, that the film starts intercutting between Earth and space as though everything's happening concurrently the moment when the true tragedy of time and the strength of the love that connects us becomes evident. And of course, by the end, when Coop goes extra-dimensional, communicating across space and time, it's love that makes it possible, which is potentially hokey, but undeniably genuine in the film. Love isn't something we invented. It's observable, powerful. It has to mean something. Time, in this film, as opposed to the rest of Nolan's work, is the villain. The mayor never. The mayor. Through the vast passage of time, the distortion of reality, unreliable memory shifts, and non-linear stories, Nolan's made a career out of time. At the center, though, are always the people, the characters. Victims of time, manipulators of time, the true nature of their stories can only be told through their relationship with it. 
So whatever Tenet's concept of time travel or inversion is, we can guess it's about more than just rewinding or fast-forwarding. Perhaps it's all to do with the choices you make and your responsibility for them. If you can reverse them to make better choices, would you or should you? For now, all we know for sure is that a Christopher Nolan movie will feature character-driven reasons for the world it creates and the way the film presents its story. What that means for Tenet, only time will tell.